Okay, well, I've already told you this morning what our text is. It was our meditation, but let me read that verse in its context because Paul uses Christ's example for a particular reason. Now, I want to read it just to remind us what that reason is, but that's not going to be the focus. Um, the reason is that we should have consideration for each other, even as Christ had consideration for us, and should be those who give to help the needs of others. But what we want to look at, of course, is that great example of giving that Jesus has given to us. So 2 Corinthians chapter 8, let me read for you verses 1 through 9. Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia, that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. And by that he means the saints in Jerusalem. And this, not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. So we urged Titus that as he had previously made a beginning, so he would also complete in you this gracious work as well. But just as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all earnestness and in the love we inspired in you, see that you abound in this gracious work also. I am not speaking this as a command, but is proving through the earnestness of others the sincerity of your love also. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our understanding this morning. And again, I want to remind you that I am going to spend a good amount of time speaking about our poverty, because we, we do need to understand that situation if we are going to appreciate the gift the Lord has given to us. So, knowing that God is, knowing that He is real, a real being, a real person with whom we can have a relationship and who tells us that He wants to have a relationship with us, and knowing that the Bible is His Word, His self-disclosure, His revelation to us that He has given to us for the express purpose of having a relationship with Him, a loving relationship we have been looking at what the Bible has to say about why we should love Him. What has the Lord done to move our hearts towards Him? Now, the first thing we looked at, of course, were the common blessings that the Lord has given to us. I've actually already mentioned them. He's given us being. We exist because of His will. He made us like himself. That sets us apart from all the other creatures, except for the angels, of course. They're creatures, and they are also in the image of God, I believe, so that we could have a relationship with him. That was God's purpose. Uh, he's cared for us throughout our entire lives, giving us every good thing that we have to enjoy. And children, see, everything comes from God, and we should praise him and thank him for that. And also the enjoyment that he gives to us in the creation. You know, we, we focus on these things quite a bit, um, especially in our lives, because we enjoy the, the things he's given us to enjoy. But we need to thank him for those things. All the wonderful things he's put into the creation, as well as the senses that he has given to us to actually perceive those things. To see them, to hear them, to smell them, taste them, touch them, and so forth, and to enjoy them. So he has blessed us in so many ways. Now, you know, the Bible actually tells us that God is the father to everyone who is in this world. He is the one who begat Adam, and everyone came from Adam, right? Everyone has, has descended from Adam and Eve. Uh, God is known as the father of all mankind. So he is, as a father, and, and as we think about our own earthly parents. He is giving to us the things that our parents gave to us. You know, we think about our parents giving us being. 
in a certain sense they did. Um, giving to us, again, protection and food and covering, taking care of us our entire lives. And what is our response to our parents uh, for doing these things for us? Well, we love them. And obviously, we need to love our Heavenly Father because He's the ultimate source of all these things. He's the one who made our parents and who gave them the ability to take care of us. All these things come from Him. But as you know, as great as those gifts are, we know that He's given us something far greater through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this morning, I want us to consider that we should love Him for saving us because we were under the just sentence of everlasting punishment, but he sent his son into the world to rescue us. Now, as I've said, to see how great this gift is, it would help us first to remember our condition. And we, we you know, saw a little bit of a preview of that in that hymn that we sang. We are guilty of infinite sin. Paul, in this verse, puts it in these terms. We were poor. Now, in this passage, we know Paul is speaking to the Corinthians to encourage them to give, uh, to help their poor brethren who are in Jerusalem. Those are the saints he's referring to there. As the churches in Macedonia had already done, he's talking here about the Philippians, he's talking about the Thessalonians and the Bereans. Now, at that time, the, the Jewish Christians, they were poor, they were suffering. But Paul was saying the Corinthians, even though they may not have had like a, a wealth of things, they were rich by comparison. Okay? He encourages them to use their abundance to supply their need. And then he goes on to say, we didn't read this part, but he said, hey, one day, you know, you may be in need, and then the Jewish believers might be able to help you. So Paul is, first of all, reminding us here that the body of Christ is, is broader than just the local church. We do need to be concerned about the needs of our brethren wherever they may be. You know, I mean, Corinth was in, in, you know, in Greece, and that's a little ways away from uh, Jerusalem and in, in Palestine. But there still needed to be concern, and there needed to be the, the care for one another. So in order to encourage them to do this, this very thing, Paul points to the greatest example of giving, and that is the example that Jesus gave. To the one who had infinite abundance, but who was willing to sacrifice this, in order that he might provide for us. Let me again read 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. So in order to understand again or to appreciate what it is that Jesus has given to us, we do need to remember our poverty how undeserving we are to receive these things. You know, we, we talk about the distinction between mercy and grace. Mercy is where the Lord doesn't give us what we deserve, and that's usually in the context, I mean, it doesn't withhold reward that we deserve, but mercy is withholding punishment that we deserve. But you see here, the Lord is giving us something we don't deserve, something good, and that is what grace is all about. Now, last week, we were reminded that God made us, okay, at the moment of conception, He gave us being. He not only created the, our bodies, but He also created our souls. But we mustn't forget the condition we were in when we were created, okay? We weren't innocent, but we were guilty. And we were guilty not because God makes sinners, but we were guilty because at the moment we were created, at that moment, Adam's sin became ours. Remember what David said in Psalm 51, as he's considering the sins that he had committed against God, that is committing adultery with Bathsheba and murdering her husband Uriah in order to cover it up. He looks back at the very cause of his sin. He writes in verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin 
my mother conceived me. Now what David is saying here is that he was not only born a sinner, but at the very moment of conception, he was a sinner. Now again, the same thing is true of us. At the moment of our conception, as, as much as we love our children, you know, as, as sweet and as innocent they look, you know, as they're just sort of, you know, smiling at us and, and making these googly sounds, right? This is true of them, and it was true of us when our existence began. When we joined the human race, even before we got to see them, you know, while they were just at the moment of conception, the sin that Adam had committed as our representative was transferred to us. We call that imputation. It was credited to our account. Now, not all of Adam's guilt, but the guilt of that one act of disobedience, that disobeying God's command not to eat of that one particular tree. Now, I know that you know, we, we have all these various interpretations of what was special about that tree. Why is it that God forbade them to eat of that tree? Was there something that was going to impart to them? Uh, I think the best explanation of it is that God was simply giving to them a test that was perhaps entirely arbitrary as far as which tree. You know, it wasn't anything special about that tree. God said you can eat from all the trees of the garden, any one of them, except for that one tree. It's believed that that was a test of simply just pure obedience. You know, Adam didn't understand why that tree he couldn't eat from, except that he knew God said not to do it. Well, we know, of course, he failed. He chose to disobey God. He rebelled against him. And he became guilty. And we also, the Bible says, became guilty in him because he represented us. So when God looks at us as we come into the world, he sees us as guilty of having eaten that tree. Not of Adam having eaten the tree, but of us having eaten that tree. We are guilty. Okay, you know, Jonathan Edwards, maybe we talked about this a little bit. He had an even more elaborate way of explaining this. He said that God creates a personal identity between us and Adam so that, he, that we actually were in the garden eating of that tree. But again, not literally, but by, by way of divine constitution. I think either way it comes out to the same thing. When Adam sinned, he sinned for us. When we became a part of the human race, we became guilty of that sin. And so as Adam received a curse for that crime, he said, God said to him, the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. We came under the same curse. We also died. Now, it's hard to think of that, isn't it? Especially when our children are young. But they come into the world dead. They're conceived dead, dead in three senses. Okay, physical death is, is what we are liable to as we come into the world. That's why we die. That's why people die. Now, we would grow up if God wills. You know, we know some people don't even make it that far. But we will grow old because of the curse, and we will eventually die because of the curse. So we are liable to physical death. Now, we know that God said to Adam, the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. He didn't die physically in that day, though it's believed that the seeds of death, as it were, began to work in him. But he did die in a couple of other senses. He also experienced what we call spiritual death, where he then no longer loved God, but hated him. And that's the way we come into the world. Just think about what Paul says in Romans chapter 5. We are God's enemies. We are fighting with God. He sends his son into the world to die for us while we're his enemies. Why are we his enemies? It's because we hate him. Adam forfeited the spirit when he committed that sin. His original righteousness, that, you know, that, what that means is the principle of love within him that moved him to love God, that was the spirit, and the spirit was gone. But when he lost the spirit, he lost the spirit not just for himself, he also lost him for the whole human race. And that's why we're in the situation we're in, because we come into the world with no spirit, and if there is no spirit, no Holy Spirit, 
there is no love. Now, here's perhaps an even um, uh, greater concern. We also um, have to experience, because of this, what's called judicial death. We are under the sentence of condemnation in God's court of law. Adam became liable to everlasting punishment when he sinned in the garden, and now we face damnation, okay? Not only for the sin of hating God, because a disposition to hate God is sin. You know, even if, if you don't act on it, <laughs> if in your heart you hate God, God still looks at that as sin. So that what was original righteousness when we had the Holy Spirit, which is this love for God, the removal of that left us with nothing but hatred for God, and we call that original sin. That's the origin of all of our acts of sin. That in and of itself is, is sin, okay? It, it's already, it makes us guilty. But, as I've already said, we come into the world also guilty of having eaten of that forbidden tree. And so we're guilty of those two things. And let's not forget, if, if we live and we grow up, and we make it through this life all the way to the end of our lives, if we never come to faith in Christ, there's a lot of other sin that, that actually we commit. When you think about it, we're supposed to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We are to obey Him to the letter. Which one of us does that at any moment, even as Christians, right? We are always full of imperfection and sin. Now, so simply to say, by the time we leave this world, we become guilty of almost limitless sins, okay? And every single one of those crimes that we commit against God, even one of them, deserves eternal damnation. And the reason, as I mentioned before, is because they are committed against an infinitely holy, infinitely just, and infinitely worthy God. We deserve damnation many times over, and that's true probably of every single one of us, um, I don't think even probably, before we come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the place of the punishment that we would endure is described in Scripture as a place of fire. I think we're all pretty much aware of that. And there's been some debate over whether it's a literal fire or not a literal fire, and uh, I don't think it really matters. Uh, you know, the reason why there's a debate is because when we, people who die before the final judgment, their soul goes to a place that is basically characterized as a place of fire. But it's only their spirit that's there. And so the question is, is that a literal fire that's tormenting their spirit? How could they feel it if they don't have a body? But see, that's why I say it doesn't really matter if it's a literal fire or not. What really matters is the fact that it's characterized as fire and it hurts like fire. Okay? It is torment. It is agony. It's, you know, it's, it's something that for us would have begun the very moment our lives in this world ended. Have you ever you know, heard the expression, well, a couple of things that are kind of troubling, which is, um, you know, this person is out of suffering now you know, because they've passed away. Well, if that person is unconverted, their suffering is, has just only begun, and it's gotten many times worse, which is a good reason why to try to save their lives, you know, rather than put an end to their lives and the hope that they might yet come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you also think about people want to do away with the death penalty, which the Bible tells us, you know, there should be a death penalty. And what's the reason usually given? Well, if you put them to death, they're not going to suffer for their crime. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. Now, if you're not going to put them to death, maybe it's so they might come to faith in Christ, but, and that's why they should be ministered to before they are put to death. But the fact is, if you put them to death, then they are getting true justice, and they will actually suffer after that. So again, it would have started at that very moment that our lives ended, and even in that situation, it would have been unbearable. Remember what the rich man says in the parable that Jesus gives? I am in agony in this flame. He was hoping that maybe just a drop of water on his tongue. And even that was denied him. But that's just the intermediate state. 
Okay? It's, it's something that would increase also. Because on the day that Jesus returns and the bodies of all the dead are going to be raised and they're going to be reunited with their souls, the bodies of the just as well as the unjust, the unjust then are going to be thrown into the lake of fire where they're going to continue to be in agony, now not just in soul but also in body. And I think there's a good argument for this, and this sounds really terrifying, that that lake of fire is really more of a vortex and that the damned souls are continually sinking into greater and greater levels of punishment because of the sins they continue to commit against the Lord while they're there. The blasphemy, the hatred, the anger, all of that is sin. And if it's true that God on the day of judgment weighs everything that we do against, well, let's say the, the sins of the wicked against them to determine their levels of punishment, what about the sins they continue to commit in the lake of fire? So the idea would be, again, the sinking forever into greater and greater agony in this lake that burns with fire, and that for time without end. Now, Jonathan Edwards tried to explain, tried to describe what hell was like. People criticized him for it, and he says, well, it can't be that bad. <laughs> and uh, I remember John Gerstner saying, as he was trying to describe what Edwards was saying about hell, he said, um, you know, Jonathan Edwards could not exaggerate hell. Jonathan Edwards cannot even come close to explaining what hell is like. No one really can. He said a thousand Jonathan Edwards could not do it. It's far worse than we can ever, ever imagine. But the, the, the words that are used to describe it in Scripture are, are those of, of probably the most painful thing we can think of, being burned alive. I mean, that's, that's probably the most painful thing that I can think of. But what makes it even worse <laughs> is the fact that it continues forever without intermission. Thomas Watson, maybe you've heard me read this quote before, but I think it's pretty good. It kind of gives us a, an idea of how much time we're talking about here. He says this, The torments of hell abide forever. If all the earth and sea were sand, if this was just one giant ball of sand, and he didn't even really understand how big the planet was, and every 1,000 years, a little bird should come and take away one grain of this sand. It would be a long time before that vast heap of sand were empty. Yet if, after all that time, the damned may come out of hell, there would be some hope. But this word forever breaks the heart. Do you know how long it would take a bird to dissemble this planet? And that every thousand years, it's going to be how much longer than that? <laughs> it's, it just goes on forever. But here's, see, here's the, the point. The point is that is what you and I deserve for our sins, okay? We're never going to be able to appreciate what the Lord has done for us unless we can understand just how dire our situation actually was. We were in danger of that very thing. Okay, that is where we would have spent eternity. And just because we can't see ourselves dangling over the pit, can't see it with our eyes, that doesn't mean the pit isn't there. You know, again, think about what Jesus said in Mark 9, verses 43 through 48. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than having your two hands to go into hell, into the unquenchable fire where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than having your two feet to be cast into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your eye causes you to stumble, throw it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Now, we know Jesus isn't saying literally cut off your limbs, but what he is saying is cut off your sin. If you don't give up your sin, you're going to perish forever. But you see, that's what God gives you the grace to do when you trust in Christ, is to give up your sin, repent of your sin, and to trust in him. So this was our situation. We were poor, and I'd say quite, quite so. But secondly, there is one who was rich, 
who became poor, that through his poverty, he might make us rich. Okay, obviously Jesus was rich. And again, here's something else that we can hardly imagine, that the one who was rich, the one who is the eternal son of God, the one that we read in Philippians 2 is equal with God, who enjoyed perfect fellowship with the Father, who possessed all life and blessedness in himself, who created the universe and owned all things, that he was willing to become poor. He emptied himself. Now, we understand that doesn't mean that Jesus, you know, he didn't cease to be God. He didn't empty himself of his divinity. He didn't drain any of his, his attributes, so to speak. But rather, he took something to himself. The one who is infinitely above us joined himself to our nature. He became a man. And as a man, he became a servant. He humbled himself to pay the price of our crimes, to take our place in God's judgment so that the Father could forgive us so that we would no longer be liable to hell, so that we would be free, so we would no longer be in that danger. But he also took our obligation to obey his Father's commandments, to love him and his neighbor, so that he could give to us a perfect righteousness so that the Father could accept us as his children. Uh, Jesus, through his work, has made us his brothers and sisters by adoption so that he might share with us his kingdom. We're going to have to look at that also in the future. Why should we love the Lord? Well, he not only saved us from the pit, but he has lifted us to unimaginable heights in making us the heirs of his eternal kingdom. He who was uh, rich became poor in order to make us rich. By the way, there's an example in this, isn't there? For us, I mean, this is the example that Paul is giving to the Corinthians in order to encourage them to think about the needs of others. Look at what Jesus did for you, he says. That's what we ought to be doing for others. But there's one last point I want to make, just a brief one. Let's not forget who it is that gave the price. Now, Jesus paid it, but the Father was the one who gave it. You can see the difference. The Father sends His Son into the world. The Son lays down His life. Now, what's remarkable about that is that the Father is the one who was offended, okay? He's the one that we sinned against. We were indebted to His justice, okay? When, when Jesus paid this price, I mean, some people have speculated and maybe some people still believe it today that Jesus paid the price to the devil in order to redeem us from Him, from His kingdom. No, we, we, the devil didn't own us. The only reason why we were following the devil is because we wanted to, but we were not indebted to him. He, he, you know, the only power that he had over us was our hearts. He knew how to tempt us. He knew how to get us to do his will. Uh, and so we willingly served him. We walked according to the prince of the power of the air, but he did not own us. Our sin did not put us in his power in that sense. We were indebted to the Father. Every sin we committed was against Him. The sin we committed in Adam, as well as all of our personal sins, every vow that we've broken, every time we've disobeyed authority, all of our hatred, all of our lust, all of our evil actions, our desires, and our words, they're all committed against Him. You know, use the example of David being conceived in and born in sin earlier, in that same psalm, David also said that when I did this, when I committed adultery with Bathsheba, when I murdered Uriah, and he did that by way of command to one of his soldiers, he said, I've sinned against you, God. You know, not, he, you know, he was thinking more about his crimes against God than he was against his neighbor. He sinned against both of them. But when he did that to his neighbor, he did that against God. All sin is committed against him. So think about this. The one who is offended, the one who would justly sentence us, the, the one who has every reason not to forgive us, is the one who made it possible for forgiveness to be given out of his great love and mercy. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And let's not forget the price that he 
gave. It, it wasn't, you know, again, as well, you know, we've been studying Islam, and in Islam, the Islamic God, Allah, can just arbitrarily forgive because as far as they're concerned, none of the sins that people commit against each other are committed against him. Instead, they commit them against each other so God can just forgive them because he has nothing to forgive, you see. But, but that isn't the case here. He can't just arbitrarily forgive. If he was to forgive, he had to pay a price that was great enough to satisfy his justice and the only payment that could possibly do that was to give his precious son, the one whom he loved more than anything else. You see, the price is much higher than we can possibly imagine for our redemption. But he was willing to do that and to put his son through what he went through to pay that, that awful payment on the cross, which was to suffer hell for us, so that we might become righteous in him so that the Father might be able to have us as his own children. So we owed the debt, okay? We had sinned and offended God. Jesus made the payment. He who was uh, rich became poor that he might make us rich. And the Father is the one who gave the payment. The one who was offended removed the offense by making, again, a payment which is unimaginably great. Now, this is what John means in his first letter when he says, God is love. And we need to understand that. Again, we won't, we won't understand the, the magnitude of that love unless we understand those things that we've just seen. So again, what, what should our response be to this? Well what he wants it to be, that we should love him. Love him in return and devote ourselves to him that we would love as he has loved. Paul gives the example of Christ and he says to the Corinthians, I want you to do what Christ did for you. We need to do that for one another. We need to love God and love each other. So may the Lord give us the grace to do that. Let's bow for just a moment of, of prayer, shall we? And as we as we pray, let's also prepare to come to the table and to remember, again, the great price Jesus uh, paid and that the Father gave for us.